Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another interview here. Uh, we've got an awesome interview today. I'm super excited. So we are talking with Ginger Bill, otherwise known as Bill. He is the creator of Odin, which is an awesome programming language with some pretty lofty goals. One of them being able to be a better alternative to C, uh, which we all know has some hmm. security implications, memory leaks, that sort of thing. So Odin will, uh, sorry, excuse me, Ginger Bill here will give us a, a short introduction about himself, and then we'll uh, he'll give a more thorough introduction about the Odin programming language, and then I've got some questions for him, and then after that, it will be a fantastic day. Yes, thank you. Take it away. Hi, I'm Ginger Bill, and thank you very much, Josh, for first doing this interview with me. Anyway, so I am Ginger Bill, the creator of the Odin programming language. Uh, the Odin programming language is... Uh, is designed with the intent of creating an alternative to C, and I've tried to do it as an alternative to C on high-performance modern systems. But one of the essence of programming is I want to still keep that joy that you have when you try and do with programming, and you don't have to worry and have all the issues with it, but you want the joy, but also the simplicity. Uh, the Odin project now is, for this language, is nearly five years old, um, officially. Uh, it's, I started it one evening late in July 2016, and I was getting really annoyed with C++. Uh, when I first started language, it was pretty much a Pascal clone. I even had the begin and end everywhere. But it quickly changed to be something quite different. Um, to but understand why I started the language, uh, I'd have to go to the beginning of that year where I set myself a, um, a New Year's resolution. So any personal project that I start would have to be in C, p plain old bog standard C. And the reason why I did that was to say, what do I actually want from a language? and find out what I wanted. And I found out, not much at all, I don't need much to be productive. So after about three months of using C, I started experimenting, like making some uh, modifications. I mean, pretty much made my own extended C compiler, um, adding new features to like deferred or slices and, and nested declarations and such. But I found very, very quickly, um, C is a broken language, very broken, and you cannot fix it. So you pretty much have to make a new language. Yeah. So that's how can, Odin came about. Okay, can can, um, can can you expand upon that? You know, so what you just said, C is a broken language. What yes. what is wrong with C? Or in other words, why can't we all just become little Linuses? <laughs> no, it's a very good question. But um, C itself is there is a C, C specification, but effectively C is defined by its compilers. And because that means C is not one language, that's fine. That's not necessarily an issue, but that is how it works in practice. But C is, uh, its type system is quite dodgy to begin with. It has many things where it's got a lot of implicit conversions going on. A lot of, in the set cases, many different issues going to be popping from that alone. But in general, there's a lot of undefined behavior in the language itself, which many people will exploit or you cannot exploit because you can have all these different issues. And undefined behavior is a very like, catch-all term, unfortunately, in C, and C++ as well, where it can mean literally anything. Like, for instance, integer arithmetic is undefined in C because C used to support one's complement and two's complement machines. Yes. So you have to remember that even some of the basic things are completely undefined. Yes, nowadays we just assume two's complement, but even in C, if you do um, overflow or underflow wrapping in general, that's undefined. So many compilers will exploit that and take, advan take advantage, and I'm doing that in inverted commas, um, what they can do with that. So there's many of these little things where you could try and fix them one by one, but then you won't be having C anymore. So you... So I've done a hell of a lot of research looking into many different languages, looking back at, back at Pascal, which is pretty much similar to C in general, looking at maybe even Oberon as well, which is a bit older, Pascal, uh, Go, just C in general, and Python, and so many different, hundreds of different languages and research and see what is the essence of make them good and what could I learn from that through language design. Okay. Mm. Um, I mean, that's, that's an awesome calling and an awesome uh, goal to have. That must be yeah. so much fun researching all that stuff. <laughs> it, it, it was, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, so, so, what do you suppose, um, you know, what, what's wrong with Rust? I've heard a lot of people talk about rewriting and Rust. It's got a lot of memory safety features. Um, I think it has some parallelism built into the language. Um, it, it's got a lot of the features, you know, C doesn't have. Why can't we just use Rust? Well, one of the things that you pointed out there is Rust is what its main goal is trying to be safe. 
And it does safety through its ownership semantics and lifetime semantics, which is, um, if you know C modern C++, it's called move semantics. Same, same idea. The issue is Odin, I do not have that goal. I'm not trying to be a safe language. I'm just being a language that's highly performant. But you, by doing certain things that more modern languages do, you actually become a hell of a lot safer than C. Like a very good example is in C, you have pointer arithmetic. Because in C, pointer arithmetic is useful because in C, there's not really a concept of like an array or array reference. Yes, you do have array types, but they automatically demote to a pointer. So then when you access an index on a, point, a pointer, you can treat it as an array. That alone is a huge issue when it comes to language science. So if you have the concept of a actual like slice or array reference or whatever you want to call it in your language, that would actually clear up a lot of issues generally that were unsafe in C, but not safe in unsafe in other languages. So that's one other. But again, Rust's focus is on safety, not necessary performance. Even if it is very high, high, high performance systems in general, it abstracts a lot of weight because it wants to be safe. So a good example of this is you, in Rust, you don't really have, and I'm doing people are going to be very pedantic here, but you don't really have manual memory management in the same way that you don't really can have custom allocators everywhere. And when you do, and you do try to use it, you're usually trying to, you're usually bypassing all of the ownership semantics and such, which means you're actually losing a lot of the safety. So to actually go there, to be very high performance, you're actually losing what the abilities of Rust. So Rust is very, does a lot automatic memory management for you, but at compile time, not runtime. If that makes any sense. <laughs> No, 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 to totally. So, I mean, essentially, uh, Rust and Odin just have different goals. Yes, very much um, so, yeah. And again, okay. I always check, recommend people check out languages and see, if, see which language, and a language in the day is just a tool, which is best for you or the problems you have at hand. So if you really think Rust is perfect for you, go and use Rust. That's what I recommend. Okay. Um, really quickly, you were talking about... Um, some of the older languages like Pascal. Yes. When I was, I think I was reading through your FAQ, FAQ I think you were saying that um, you got some inspiration from older programming languages. Yes. Um, I, I guess the uh, young, silly male in me likes to think that's silly. Why would you get inspiration from old languages? Would you mind poking holes in that for me? Well, this is the thing is a lot of people forget that actually a lot of the problems have already been solved by older things. They just, okay. yeah, like, like many things like in general, like, it's like oh, so one of my favorites uh, language line is, is Nick House Viet, or if you want to say it in American, Nicholas Wirth. Um, he is a Swedish program. He designed uh, Pascal. He is the creator of Pascal. He is also well known for many books. For instance, I've got some on my shelf right now. Uh, <laughs> right. One of them here is one of my favorites, which is algorithms plus data structures equals programs. This book is a brilliant thing for beginners. I usually recommend if you can get your hands on it more. It's from the 70s. And there's another one as well, which is systematic programming and introduction. These are very good books and uh, stuff like that. He's one developer also did Pascal. He did the Oberon language and compiler and operating system. It's a very good thing if you want to learn how to make operating systems as well. He's done that because most of his stuff when he designed it was for teaching mainly. But a lot of things was very interesting with the design. Like back in the day, he was one of the chaps who was telling people to use recursive descent parsers um, just everywhere. And the thing is, they're now pretty much the bog standard thing. And I still use them all the time as well. So I've learned a hell of a lot from him, especially with regards to compiler design and also language design. And also another uh, person I wrote on there, I was an inspiration, is, is Rob Pike, which I know people have controversial views about him, but at the end of the day, I think he's a very a, a brilliant language designer and such. Most people know him for the Go programming language, but he has created many languages in the past for many different purposes and tools. And many of them, again, have influenced the way I've actually programmed and designed Odin itself. Okay. This is actually getting really fun, like taking notes as we go along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's absolutely, yeah. <laughs> So I guess the, the third question I had for you, Ginger Bill, is, um, you know, what, what do you feel about some of your competitors in the terms of um, young alternatives to C? Uh, Zig comes to mind. I yes. guess um, Scopes is a, is a yes. Lambda scheme kind of implementation, not scheme, but it looks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I know what you mean, yeah. And then you've. I guess that you've also got uh, Drew DeVault has a secret programming language. Drew DeVault, of course, wrote the Sway <laughs> window manager, which is what I'm running on my computer now. Yeah. Um, how do their goals differ from yours for, for the language? Um, interesting. We've all kind of got different philosophies. That's the first thing you need to understand. 
I always recommend everyone literally try out as many languages things. I know Andrew Kelly, which is the creator of Zig language already, and people recommend Zig. Uh, I know, um, I call him Panic. I don't know <laughs> what he's going by these days now, the creator of Scopes. Um, I know <laughs> of the Devolts secret programmer language but the problem is it's not public yet so i can only judge by what's on the uh, the blog post so i cannot give it a fair criticism being critical not so positive or bad in that regards um so they've all got kind of different philosophies behind them and as a result they have very different fuels to use in a programming and certain people prefer one or the other um Odin itself is pretty much a, hey, look, what are the actual problems that people have most of the time? Okay, de design around them. So Odin has built-in data structures. For instance, okay, I've got array types. I've got arrays, slices, dynamic arrays built into language, even though they use custom authenticators, so you have high, high control. You also have enumerated arrays, which means the key itself is an enum, which means you can do some pretty cool stuff with it. And it's very, very useful. Um, there's also a dynamic map built into the language as well. Again, these seem like very high level features, but they can be very designed to be very high performance. But again, these okay. are things like, okay, this is what the people want. Okay, there's a well-defined concept of what a package is in the language. There is many different things which, okay, they're designed in there. You can go lower if you need to and you can make your own, but there's a general convention of what things are. Conventionality is in there. People are used to what, how these things work and also I'm um, defined some general conventions. Zig, on the other hand, is probably a little bit more unconventional in both senses. It's as in, it's a bit different to how everyone else does things. And it's also, it's less defining conventions and it allows you to have basic building blocks to build up. So it's this general idea of, do you want the tools in front of you? Well, are they just general for 99% of your tasks? Or do you want to have the tools to build your other tools? And it's a very different way of thinking. Different people think different way. So it'll, it'll be one better than the other for someone else, if that's clear. No, yeah, very. Okay. I, uh, yeah, that, thanks for that explanation. That makes a whole lot of sense. Um, mm. uh, so the, the next question I had for you, um, <clears throat> on your FAQ, um, I, I noticed that you currently use LLVM to yes. translate code to platform-specific code. You also write that a custom backend is in development. What's its status? Um, and forgive me because I'm not a very super technical guy. Is this back end the same thing as being self hosted? Okay, so there's, there's three things that break down. So currently, the main back end is LLVM. There was work on a, on a custom one when I was writing the FAQ, but that's been pretty much abandoned for the time being because focusing just on LLVM. So you have one main back end, which you know is very well polished and make sure that's very well developed for everyone else. When with this more time and general and just better more resources as well, especially manpower, um, then we can probably work on a custom backend. As for self-hosting on the FAQ, it's the very last thing I actually state. And many people ask me, is the Odin compiler self-hosted? My personal view, which has been the same literally from day one, is I am not, um, Odin is not currently self-hosted, but in, it won't be until after version 1.0 is out of the language. This is when there's a main implementation of the compiler which is stable, and that com implementation adheres to a written specification of the language and is heavily tested, like heavily tested. Because doing it before then, in general, my personal view is if you want a self-hosting language before a stable language and compiler even exists, it's just masturbatory pleasure. Like, all you're doing is you're just m m not doing anything really productive. I know there are benefits to having it, but it's my personal view is there is better things to do with your time. <laughs> yes. Wait, please, please tell me you do Santa on the weekends. That was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't know. Oh, gosh. Um, <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. Um, well, you know, j just throwing a thought out there um mm. i don't know if you're familiar with i think it's called um reproducer builds or maybe bootstrappable.org something like that mm. um in in the gnu geeks language they're actually recommending when you write a programming language please 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 don't write the compiler in the programming language it makes it tough yeah. to um port to other platforms um, I know Zig is has a way of um, bootstrapping the compiler, and they intend to keep that going for the foreseeable future. Yeah, Zig's um, approach is very, um, if they want bootstrapping, it's kind of a sense approach. They have stages like stage series one, two, and stuff like that, where the different stages bootstrap each other. 
So eventually the whole, and I think Zig eventually will be mostly bootstrapped soon. I think Andrew's plan in the next seven months, the, most of the incompile will be completely written in Zig, which is very, uh, very impressive in that regard. But he is relying on the bootstrapping process, where Odin's more a very more conservative approach. Like, okay, when we've got 1.0, then we can worry about writing in the language because we know the compiler's stable. We know it's going to be fine. We don't have to do all of those horrible tricks if anyone's ever done um, bootstrapping in compiler. Is that if you've got a bug, well, you've got to make a bug to fix the bug, and then you've re fixed the bug. It's kind of like uh, I understand. I've done it before. It's quite sometimes fun to do, but it's not. It's not really a good idea. <laughs> so I don't usually recommend people doing it unless. You just want to do it for fun, for obvious reasons. Sure, sure. I, I'm actually kind of curious to see if um, Zig's compiler and uh, your compiler and other C alternatives, if they're writing their <laughs> own language, you know, in themselves. Like, I wonder, like, is there going to be something that's going to compete against LLVM? That, you know, it's just written in a faster language than than C plus plus. That'll be interesting, I think. Well, I I think. It's, LLVM is not inherently so because it's C++, of course. It's just um, the style that has been written in, there's going to be many issues. Because LLVM, for Odin at least, the biggest bottleneck in the Odin compiler is LLVM. For the average build, it's probably at least two-thirds to three-quarters of the entire compile time. Wow. If not more, for large systems. Um, for instance, one of the large projects I work on, that's about it takes up 90% of the compile time, which is showing you how slow um, LLVM can be. There are tricks to speed it up as well, but it is a big bottleneck, especially if you don't want something that's heavily optimized yet. If you're doing a release build, then yeah, I don't really care how long it takes usually. Um, but if it's a development build or a debug build, then yeah, I want it to be a bit quicker. <laughs> but yeah, there's, um, that's kind of the thing is where LLVM, I'm going to say LLVM and GCC are probably the two big ones at the moment where they've got heavily opt the optimized backends and they can give you very, very good code. And competing with that is okay. It's going to be very difficult. You're going to need tens of millions of dollars to do that because you're going to need a lot of people to actually get to that skill. You can get pretty close to it, by the way, but you're still going to need a lot of time and resources. So if you're only caring about another backend, which is easy to implement and also um, maybe portable and also just fast to compile, not necessarily optimized code, then that is very much doable. I know Zig is do trying to do that as well with its bootstrapping process, and I know a few other languages are doing it as well. Um, that's not a plan currently for Odin, but it is a plan eventually in the future, for definite. Okay, very cool. Um, so, so forgive me for being a bit of a, of a GNU fanboy. Yeah, yeah no um, problem. I, I've, I've actually got like a, a homemade bleach t-shirt of like RMS in the back and GNU <laughs> on the front. I'm about as big as a fanboy as you can get. Um, so wh why would you say most, um, new programming languages, at least that I'm seeing, why do they seem to target LLVM as the back end? Is LLVM just better than GCC, or does LVM MIT's licensing just help a lot? So there's actually a few aspects here. So one is definitely the licensing. Um, many people do not like the GNU licenses for because it's viral, and because of that virality, it's very issue. It's very it's very big issues. Um, it's one of the reasons why I didn't do with Odin. Odin's licenses, um, the BSD clause ones, the BSD2D clause, two clause. Um, I've always preferred the, B the BSD ones for other reasons, um, other than MIT, because you can always just add and remove clauses. That's the main reason. Um, but the other reason is that at the time, LLVM, you can actually use as a library. And GCC wasn't really designed that way. Because uh, GCC is very old. It's probably 30 years old at this point, if not more. I can't Whenever it was created, it's, it's probably about that. And um, the issues with that is that it's got a lot of cruft in it. And because there's a lot going in, that doesn't mean it doesn't produce bad, good quality code. It does produce a lot of code. And also it also supports a lot more targets than LLVM does. Um, it just means that integrating that into a pre-existing like, workflow is not going to be easy. Um, while LLVM is much easier in that regard, it's still not necessarily brilliant, um, but it's a lot easier. And then another point is that LLVM does have some benefits compared to GCC with regards to optimizations. Um, LLVM is has got some of the best um, auto vectorizing optimizations in there compared to GCC, but GCC's got some hell of a lot much better ones, especially for tail f um, tail recursion optimizations. Uh, LLVM's is awful in comparison, <laughs> but it's um, it's a very good. It's like GCC's is very huge and optimized, and it's like okay, it can do a lot of tail call optimizations. It's like yeah, it knows what it's doing. So I, I definitely like it when you're uh, 
talking nerdy to me. Yes. Yeah, don't worry. Yeah. I was like, I know what telecom optimization is. Yes, don't I got worry. one. Don't worry about that. That's me. I'm just talking about very, very, like, I down and dirty <laughs> but i'm no, just saying like there's no. if there's the technical bits why people would prefer one or the other and there's the high level bits which is like licensing and easy integration yeah no definitely um i i think it's always fun to learn new technology um mm -hmm. my dentist would be cleaning my teeth and he'd say something like you know 10 syllables long and he'd like i'm talking nerdy to you <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's when one of those dentists go oh which number is it which are your teeth and i'm like i don't know what you're doing when you're saying numbers and when you're checking my teeth okay thank you <laughs> Um, uh, okay, so uh, Ginger Bill, what is the current status of Odin? Um, should people start building things with Odin? Well, to answer the second point first, many people are already doing so. Um, my main current job now is actually programming in Odin. So I work with JangraFX, um, which is the developer of EmberGem, which is a real-time volumetric fluid simulation for games and films. It's a software that allows you to make explosions and smoke and um, fire and stuff like that. It's a very cool piece of software, and that's all being developed in Odin itself. Um, the team we're on is about 10 or 11, 12 people, depending on how you count. And there's about of those developers, six of them are developing in Odin full-time, which is absolutely awesome. amazing. It's surreal, I'll tell you that. Um, that is so cool. Yeah, yeah. So the current status is is pretty good. The language, I'm very careful, so I'm making a separation between the language, the libraries, the compiler, and the ecosystem. The language is about done. It has been about done for about a year. There's some new stuff I've been adding here and there, um, some new features. Like to, like literally the other day, I added Swizzling to the language. So you have an array, you can do Swizzlings, like, like if you're in a shader language, because it's a very, it has, a, there's an operations that already do that on the um, hardware. Like you can do sh shuffle a vector around very easy with a mask. So it's like, oh, I can I give that to a nice, elegant way to the user to do that with standard arrays. And it just works perfectly. So people are used to it. It's lovely. So some minor things like that, but it doesn't change the entire aspect of the language. The compiler is is not 100% kind of like done or ready to be there, but it's it's good enough for that. We need to make sure when we are done with the language, write specification, uh, make sure the compiler adheres to it. The other things like the core library and the tooling, there are still a lot of work to there. The core library is getting fleshed out by the day. Uh, there's been recently new stuff adding that. For instance, we've got some image uh, stuff like that, and also decompression and some people work on cryptography things, going through all of that. Uh, there's there's a lot to actually keep fleshing out what we want from the core library. Effectively, the idea of Odin is to get kind of like batteries included, so most of the stuff you want to do will be in the core library for you, rather than you having to rely on many third-party stuff. But again, third-party stuff will be required for many other things. For tooling-wise, there's a lot of other things we're building. For instance, we're, at the moment, uh, one person is developing the Odin Fumpt, the Odin uh, formatter. So you got your code, you put it through Fumpt, it, puts, it gives you the style formatted correctly for you, you remove that bike shedding argument entirely. Don't have to worry about if you're using tabs or spaces or where your brace style is. The th format will just format it correctly for you. Remove that argument entirely. It's a nice little thing. I know some people say, oh, it's a bit annoying. I'm like, yeah, you can turn it off. You don't have to use it. But it, we'll be using it for the core library at least to make sure everything's consistent. And it also will help with transitions to anything else for other people. Yeah, there's a lot of things. Literally, literally yesterday, someone said they wanted to be making a package manager for Odin, which is great. Um, so there's many different things coming along in the time. All right. Yeah. Um, I, I'm sorry. You, you, you piqued my interest. The, the, yeah, yeah. The, the six people talking about six people, six. Yes. The, so there are currently six Odin jobs. Yes. Which is awesome. Um, oh, no, it's, it's, it is great. Um, so is that something that program, can you use that in Blender? Is it for games specifically? What's it, what's it for? <laughs> So this program is Embergen itself. So it's a, you can literally, it's a th volumetric thing. So 3D simulations of smoking games. So you can export these the, this in Embergen, export your simulations to either a flipbook or a VDB, open VDB format. So the open VDB bit you can put into your like Blender or Maya or open Cinema 4D and render it there if you need to. Or we have a built-in render, which is very real time and everything, by the way. So you then render that to a flipbook, which then you can put into games like Unreal or Unity and such where flip books okay. are pre-processed, you don't have to render them. So this is very useful for that. So that's how it's good. And people are enjoying the software. They're much, very much in loving it. Good, good. Um, that's kind of the main questions that I had for, for Gingerbill here. 
Um, is, is there, you know, how can people get involved with your project? Uh, where's, where's the best way to meet? Well, the best place to talk is first go onto the website, which is odinlang.org. Uh, that's where we've got a lot of the stuff on there. You can find out other places to find, such as uh, the general community in general. We're, um, we're many people very active on the Odin Discord. Um, I also recommend checking out the GitHub for Odin. So that's where the source is, where the development is happening. Um, there's also a wiki, a wiki on there, as well as a discussions board on there, because GitHub has recently added that, so we've added that as well. This is very, very useful. Um, so they're a very good places to do. You can always contact me as well, which would just be bill at odin-lang.org. That's one way of contacting me. You can find that on the website. It's very easy to do so. But yeah, um, there's many places where people can help out. Please, um, just trying out the language is one good thing. Reporting any um, bugs or criticisms or like improvements you can do. You can always contribute to the code base. That's always, again, it's always welcome. Um, and just helping other people out as well, helping other people who are new to it. That's always a great thing to do with the community. Okay. Mm. Well, uh, Ginger Bill, Bill, thank you for yes, your sir. time. It's been a lot of fun. No, um, thank you. Y your project is, is one that I think is absolutely fantastic, and I'm glad we got people working on it because it'll be cool to see where it goes. Yes. And with that, I suppose we'll, unless you have a closing thought, I guess we'll close the interview out. Yeah, um, I'll just end with is, um, again, try out Odin if you like. Try and see if you enjoy it. Please, again, with any language, just try it out and see what it is and try and try, treat it like it, the way it wants to be treated. Odin has many different things that are very different to other languages, but it's been designed in a way that it will feel extremely natural. It will feel like intuitive to use and you won't be fighting it all the time. Um, it's got some very high level concepts already in the language. You've got, you've got basic data structures, you've got structs, enums, unions, which are like um, in discriminated unions, by the way. You've got bit sets, which are a better alternative to using like bit flags. Like these, like instead of using like um, enums as flags, I'm like, no, bit sets are pretty much what you use. And, and it, interestingly, most people's favorite feature when you ask them will go to, oh, well, the bit sets in Odin. I'm like, oh, okay, there's such a minor thing, but it's just so powerful. Um, it's like, oh, okay, there's. Um, uh, Odin has full-on um, Unicode support, so source code is soon to be, soon to be UTF-8, so which means you can have Unicode identifiers. There is um, a high level of the context system, which is the implicit context system, which is you pass an implicit value through every single procedure when it holds stuff like, for instance, the current context allocator or the temporary allocator or the logger and many other things in there, which allows you to a uh, huge control over your actual program and also third parties code as well like intercepting how a third party allocates something or just understanding how it does and tracking it you can do that with the context system very very easily um odin again is a manual management and stuff like this so you have a huge amount of control of your memory layout memory allocations and understanding and reasoning about your program so again i highly recommend everyone try odin um just go on to odinlang.org and download probably the latest build all right. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Ginger Bill. I guess with that, we'll, we'll conclude the interview. Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much, Joshua.